Now, on BTC One, in a change to our lineup, Pipes Phobe Rich Lorden speaks with continuity announcer Mark Waddington, marking 30 years since the inaugural broadcast of legendary Halloween hoax Ghost Watch. I mean, the way I got into it was that, that um, you know, d- during my school days, I was quite interested in voices. You know, I mean, people, <laughs> people, people collect stamps, don't they? I, I collected voices and I was quite interested in, you know, vocal performance. I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't particularly outgoing or extrovert or anything like that. But, you know, I used to watch a lot of films and TV and, and think, oh, there's a great voice, you know, and... Uh, quite early on in my teens, you know, I, I, I decided that that's what I wanted to do. Um, I mean, I started off in radio. Um, but when the, when an advert came out for a continuity announcer on BBC One, BBC Two uh, came out, um, the first thing I did, a bit like your dad, was analyse what made a good continuity announcer. So I I recorded continuity announcers and thought about how quick, quickly they spoke, where they put the emphasis, because I, you know, that was that was thing something that I was interested in, um, and I, I was from the north, so I had a bit of a northern accent. You see, so I thought, well, they don't speak with northern accents, so I've got to, I've got to get rid of that, obviously, <laughs> um, and when I went down for the for the audition with John Glover. Um, I, I spoke as I thought a continuity announcer should speak. Um, and John Glover, after the audition, said, you're the first person today who sounds like a continuity announcer. Um, and I, you know, I still agonise over this because, you know, I, I think we need to have ownership of our own voices. I think that's really important. Um, so here I was imitating somebody else, you know, another... Uh, another person, an announcer, some, somebody who sounded like the BBC. Um, but they gave me the job. And then after uh, the first year, I had an annual report. And my annual report began, Mark has a slight northern accident, but this is not unpleasant. <laughs> you know, as, as, if, as if to say, you know, you'd expect it to be unpleasant, but surprisingly, it wasn't unpleasant, you know. Um, so that, that so that was the world we were in, you know, where where you had to sound a particular way. So, you know, I think we were all male, middle class, you know, educated a certain way. Um, and during my time there, um, you know, I think there was a lot of debate about regional accents and um, culture and authenticity and that sort of thing. So I think it, it changed, you know, you know, I'm glad it did really, you know, I think, I think you know, as I say, people need to own their own voice and be proud of who they are. And that needs to be respected by broadcasters, you know, and, and presented, you know, as the voice of real people, not not the voice of some sort of institution. So, you know, I'm glad things have moved on, really. What struck me at the time is very different from what struck me since. Um, I think you know, just going in reverse order, what what struck me since is that, um, you know, we're living in, I suppose, what people describe as a post, post-truth post world, you know, where, you know, fake news and all that kind of stuff. Um, that That's interesting. Um, back then, I think we were at a transition between an old world which was very precise. I mean, you, you described your dad as uh, very analytical. I think, I think in that, uh, that time, um, everything was about precision. Um, you know, announcers, the way they spoke had to be precise. You know, diction had to be precise. Grammar had to be precise. Um, meaning had to be precise. And, and that was, I mean, I was, I was trained by John Glover when I arrived at, um, television center and um you know he was a stickler for all that and one of the things you know he he instilled in me was that you know we had a role which was to make sure that the audience had the information they needed in order to make a decision about what they wanted to watch 
you know, and in particular parents. You know, they had to they had to have the information in order to be able to decide what they were going to allow their children to watch. So it was our job to be really clear about the genre, you know, uh, the context and all the rest of it. Um, uh, since then, I think things have changed. You know, I think things are much more about personality, impact, brand, all that kind of stuff. But at the time, you know, I was straddling this old world and this new world. Um, you know, it was all about precision. And um, so when the uh, we we got VHSs of the of the programs to watch before they went out. So so on that morning, I settled down to watch a VHS of Ghost Watch, and I thought, you know, what what what's my job here? Well, my job is to say what genre it is and give people information. You know, another interesting as facet of this is that the announcers were, you know prior to my time, I suppose, held in high regard. And they were kind of, they had an editorial responsibility and their job was to view the programmes and to, you know, along with the editors, flag anything that was of concern. So, you know, I could view a programme and say, I I'm not really clear about that or there might be a bit of libel going on in this. And the editors would sort of scratch their heads and think, no, what do we do about this? Do we need to, you know, put a slide up to clarify something or or whatever. So so the 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 burden of editorial responsibility was quite large. We shared that with the editor, but the announcers. I mean, uh, you know, w one indicator of this was that um, historically all all the the transmission chain came through the announcers' cubicle. So the announcers had the power to, you know, turn off the network. <laughs> It, did, it doesn't happen like that now, as far as I know, but th that was a, a signal that, that, you know, the announcers were a kind of an authoritative person who had some sort of control and responsibility towards the network. So when I was presented with this ghost watch thing, my immediate reaction was to say, trick or treat, you know, this is, this is, um, this is a drama, it's... Uh, you know, Michael Parkinson et al. playing a part, you know, they were, uh, you know, it's it's not a real thing, you know, all, all the rest of it. I was thinking of all those parents, you know, who, who were trying to make a decision about what, what their children were wanting to watch, because that's how I was trained. Um, and then the, and then the, the programme itself, because they, they intervened and said, well, we would rather you didn't say those things because we want to maintain the pretense that this is uh, a real ghost watch. So then there was a kind of a standoff between the editor and the programme saying, well, you know, we don't want him to say this, uh, but that's his job, you know, uh, what do we do? So the head of presentation got involved and the script ended up being a, a script by committee, which, um, which was... Um, you know, I, I mean, I didn't like the script particularly, but there, there it was, you know. Um, so I was very nervous about it. And then I think Channel 4, I think it was Channel 4 or The Guardian or something, um, reported in one of their reviews, uh, one, of the, one of the article writers said, and the announcer didn't even make it clear that this was a drama. You know, I was thinking, you know, uh, this was... This was kind of obviously a, a sore point, really. But anyway, that that's that's how I, uh, you know, experienced it. Not not specifically, but there were a few. You know, I I I, I tinkered with it, and then it came back said, no, no, we've got to do something else, and you know, it, it went back a, 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 you know a few times. But I think I think you're right to 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 think about that because the the context. And it's very important, isn't it? Because um, this was live broadcasting or live television, uh, even though it's on tape, it was presented as live. Um, and people watched uh, BBC One um, as a national event, didn't they? You know, on the transition into the digital revolution, wasn't it? But, you know, hugely more people watched television 
together than they do now. I mean, now it's so fragmented, isn't it? You know, people will watch, you know, YouTube video and the explanation and context is there in the notes. People will watch something, you know, on iPlayer or the equivalent or Netflix and all the information about the context and the background is there together with the program. But of course, um, in family viewing, you know, big national viewing, you know, in the corner of your living room, you know, it doesn't come with notes, does it? It doesn't come with those explanatory uh, details. So the job of the announcer is actually quite difficult because in just in a few seconds, you know, you've got to get across the important information that might help the viewer just understand w what it is they're, they're watching. I watched it when you contacted me, uh, you know, I haven't, I admittedly haven't watched it all, all the way through, but it did, it did bring back, uh, you know, I have seen it, I have seen it at least twice because I watched it on VHS before the transmission. And then I watched the live, um, as live uh, broadcast. And, uh, so I've seen it twice and then I've, I've watched, watched it, uh, on YouTube since, um, it is an extraordinary piece of television and I, and I, I can't say that I understand it necessarily. And I think it was, a, you know, one of the things I, I feel really strongly about is that the BBC and other broadcasters need the space to make mistakes and to experiment. And I think, um, again, this is, this is going back to a, to a previous era, pre-marketing and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, when the BBC was much more producer led, they made a lot more mistakes, but they also made a lot more gains in terms of experimentation and uh, and cut through in terms of innovation. Um, now, I think it's much more difficult to be innovative. Um, so I, I would defend the, the, the right of any broadcaster to experiment and make mistakes. I think in many ways, and I know people, some people love it, some people think it was a terrible thing, but, you know, I think it was good that the BBC was able to have a go at that um you know i do i do question the aspect of viewer trust um you know if if you're a parent and you're trying to make a decision about what to watch and your child does end up traumatized by something you can reasonably say to the broadcaster well i trusted you on this and you let me down you know uh, and i think that was probably one of the mistakes for some people um, because the first thing that I knew that there was going to be some sort of furor about about this was the editor ringing me up and saying we're getting an awful lot of complaints. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, ch 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 you know, parents are reporting that their children are, uh, are traumatised. All the rest of it. So we knew something was, uh, you know, amiss. Um, but you know, um, I don't know what to say really. I, I think I think with hindsight. You know, it could have been handled differently. But as I say, I would defend the right of an organisation to, you know, to experiment, really. I mean, my feelings about that are quite clear, really. I, I think you can apply the law, but, you know, in reality, um, you know, people make their own choices according to common sense, don't they? And a lot of people have said, because Mike Smith was in it, because Sarah Green was in it, but it must be okay, you know. And and I think I, I don't I don't think people watch television looking at the letter of the law. Oh, at nine o'clock, you know, this stops and this starts. You know, I think you know I think people I, I think it's right that people make their own choices, informed choices, um, you know. And I think it's wrong to assume that everything before nine o'clock is, is suitable for for every audience, you know. And I think that so so I think it's a you know, it's a problem that we de we depend too much on the on the watershed. You know, I think people need information. They need to be able to make their own choices, whether it's before or after nine o'clock. That's my view, anyway. Well, I, I I moved into production. You know, in the early nineties, around about the time of Ghost Ghostwatch, I suppose. You know, I moved, moved in to become a producer there, and um, I finished that in. 2007 I sort of went on to do charity work and all sorts of other things but um, I think I, I think what what the privilege has been has been that the BBC has changed 
radically from the 80s through the 90s to the you know 2020s you know there's been an, a complete and utter transformation with the explosion of channels but the culture was completely different and um the bbc was relatively wealthy it had you know the biggest market share um producers led the way creativity was absolutely important it, it defined itself as or wanted to define itself as the most creative organization in the world it said that explicitly um and it, and it gave people the space to do that. And Television Centre was like the Hogwarts of, of the media. You know, it was like, you know, if you if you were an aspiring wizard and went to Hogwarts, you know, you'd, you'd think, fantastic, this is where I should be. Well, if you were a broadcaster, you know, Television Centre was like that. You know, it was full of staircases and corridors with people doing extraordinary things. I mean, we, the announcer's office was next door to, um, at one point, Alexi Sales, uh, comedy writing office, you know, and and the writers would pop in, and you know we'd have chats with them, and then um, you know there were all these uh, workshops with people building incredible sets, and there was the Doctor Who scenery dock, you know, and all the props were there, and you know the whole building, you know, from news, current affairs, uh, all sorts of different kinds of programming, were all kind of mashed up together, um, and that was a fantastic creative environment. I mean, when you went to the uh, the canteen you need to be queuing up with um, a mutant from Doctor Who and there'd be and and there'd be um, you know Ronnie Barker or some somebody like that you know queuing up for their egg and chips you know and uh, Warren Mitchell sitting down with Johnny Spate talking about scripts and stuff like that so it was a, it was an incredibly creative um, atmosphere and I, and I think I think that's disappearing now because the BBC's um, you know, become much more of a publisher with, uh, you know, a lot more of that activity pushed out to little satellite organisations and independent companies. Um, not to say that that's wrong, but, um, you know, the, the, the critical mass, the intensity of that, that creative atmosphere, that, that space was, was very important, I think. Um, so whether, whether, you know, wh where creativity will go, I'm not quite sure. But I do feel that, that it's become much more marketing led so um broadcasting or organizations will analyze it's going back to analysis a bit like your dad again isn't it you know they, they will analyze what works what doesn't they'll create a formula uh, and they'll and they'll they'll tie the producers and artists down to what works and there'll be much less creative freedom to to experiment so so i think inevitably something has been lost but you know who knows? You know, I don't know. I, I can't really comment beyond that. But that's my suspicion that, that creative people are feeling a lot more frustrated now because they're having to, you know, fit in with marketing demands. It's a really interesting question. I, I'm, I'm just thinking, uh, you know, thinking aloud, really. I, I, I think I think these uh, programmes like, you know, the nine o'clock news, the 10 o'clock news, um, local radio, you know, as in Alan Partridge uh, and others, they they have status in the in the in the in the national scene, don't they? You know, they're, they're, they're part of our everyday lives. And I think that makes them a target, doesn't it? To, you know, for, um, you know, satirical or otherwise, uh, you know, writers, you know, and I think I think that's fair, isn't it, really? You know, if somebody's in a privileged position working on a TV station or a radio station and they have the honour and privilege of um, being listened to, they also deserve to be challenged and mocked if necessary. And I think that's that's fair enough. You know, I think that's, you know, that's part of how our democracy works, isn't it? You know, I think, you know, I think we need more satirical uh, writers having a go at government and and so on I th and i think satire and poking fun is often a better way of um presenting a critical voice uh than than out and out confrontation isn't it? it it sort of softens the edge but it makes the point really um you, you know re re really in a powerful way doesn't it it's uh you know uh poking fun and 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 unpicking the, the absurdities of of 
you know, sometimes local radio. I mean, local radio, I think, went through a bit of a bad patch. I mean, I was part of the local radio scene, you know, in Leeds and, and Middlesbrough be before I went down to London. Um, and I think a lot of it was really quite bad. You know, what, what was Alan Partridge? You know, and I, I'm, I'm really glad that, uh, you know, there were people who who were prepared to say, actually, this this is a bit naff, isn't it? You know, let, let's let's take the piss out of this, you know. Uh, and, and that's good, isn't it? Because it keeps everybody on their toes. I think the audience, some sections of the audience related very strongly to the announcers, particularly people who were on their own, people who watched television because they, you know, lived alone and perhaps were elderly, you know, and, and I got letters from from people saying, um, you know, how much they appreciated the continuity announcers, you know, and they kind of got to knew, know them and, you know, that was that was nice. but. I think a lot of other people really didn't care, particularly, you know, they didn't. Uh, I mean, I remember, um, was it the late, late breakfast show? They did a, a stunt where they put a camera in somebody's home and watched them watching television live. Um, and then Noel Edmonds would uh, suddenly say to that particular viewer, I'm watching you, you know, as if to say, you know, it's a bit spooky, isn't it? You know, I, I can see you uh, kind of thing. But we get we get a feed of that, I mean, it sounds terribly creepy now, doesn't it? But we get a feed of that particular um, household coming into the continuity suite. So as I was doing the continuity announcement into um, Noel Edmund's show, I could see this family sitting there watching it. And, you know, my, my, my recollection is that they didn't, you know, they, they didn't really care, you know, they were, they were eating their crisps and not really taking any notice at all. <laughs> you know, it was quite demoralising. I, you know, I, I felt, you know, that I had the urge to say, actually, I can see you. You know, you, you know just just pay attention. But obviously, I'd, I'd have got the sack if I'd done that. I, I I really don't know. I mean, I think listening back to it, I think there were sufficient clues that it was a that it was a drama. But I'm aware that people, people only half listen, don't they? And people hear what they want to hear. So in this case, people wanted it to be a ghost watch with Michael Parkinson and the crew, and that's what they got. Um, and I think however I'd phrased it, I think that's what people would have understood. Well, if you enjoyed being scared witless, something ghastly next here on One. Get those cheese and pickles sandwiches ready. It's National Seance 2022. <laughs>